Welcome back. You're listening to Prophecy Reality Edition of Cross the Border. And um, we're going to continue in this segment uh, into the book, History Unveiling Prophecy, or Time as an Interpreter by H. Grattan Guineas. And I just put a link in the chat room for the PDF of what we're going through. Uh, if you'd like to buy a copy of this, you can navigate to um, my homepage at crosstheborder.org. And I think uh, if you click on the Get the Book tab, let me put that up there so we can go through that. Oops, I guess, uh, yeah, if we uh, go up here, let's see, Cross the Border. Put that on the screen there, whoops, desktop. There it is. Uh-huh. And you click on the um, Get the Book tab, right there. And because uh, I don't have it posted on my website yet, but if you scroll down here to the bottom of the Get the Book tab, you'll see right under the Hori Apocalyptic, a last prophecy, it says save with pocketbook editions here. And if you click on that, that'll you'll see it'll be the top book in the when it shows up on my Lulu uh, publishers page there. So you can purchase a copy there if you'd like to do that. Okay, that's uh let's jump into it. Get it on the screen here. Uh, when we left off, we were in the middle of this paragraph on page 34 of the, uh, of which chapter? I don't know which chapter. Chapter 4, page 34. And so I'm going to back up to the beginning of this paragraph here and start there. Before the conclusion of the 11th century, the papacy under Gregory VII had risen to such a height of power as well as pretension and abused it to the enforcement of such unchristian dogmas, albeit in the professed character of Christ's vicar, as to force on the minds of the more discerning, surmising about the popes and papal Rome, and their possible prefiguration in apocalyptic prophecy, scarce dreamed of before. Already, just before the year 1000, Gerbert of Rheims had spoken in solemn council of the pope upon his lofty throne, radiant in gold and purple, and how that, if destitute of charity, he was Antichrist, sitting in the temple of God. And Beringer, in the 11th century, as if apocalyptically instructed, and with special reference to the Pope's enforcement of the Antichristian dogma of transubstantiation, declared the Roman See to be not the, apost not the apostolic seed, but the seed of Satan. Joachim Abbas, elected abbot of the monastery of Curaco in Calabria about the year 1180, who had a great repute as an expounder of prophecy, had a greater repute as an expounder of prophecy than any other in the Middle Ages, taught in his valuable commentary on the Revelation that as Christ is both king and priest, Satan would put forth first okay, that as Christ is both king and priest, Satan would put forth the first beast of Revelation 13 to usurp his kingship and the second to usurp his priestly dignity, the latter having at its head some mighty prelate some universal pontiff, as it were, over the whole world, who may be the very Antichrist of whom St. Paul speaks as being extolled above all that is called God and worshipped, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Thus, gradually the idea of the professedly Christian character of the predicted Antichrist penetrated the minds of leading expositors in the Middle Ages, and the view that the professing Christian church would, would be the sphere of his manifestation, the notion 
that the foretold breakup of the Roman Empire had not taken place because the Greek Byzantine ruler was still, after the Gothic catastrophe, called the Roman Emperor. And that, there, and that therefore the rise of the Antichrist should still be regarded as a future event, long hindered the application of the prophecies concerning Antichrist to the papacy, as also the supposition entertained in the Middle Ages that the period in which they lived was part of the apocalyptic millennium precursor to the three and a half year season of Satan loosing and the manifestation of Antichrist, the passing away of the millennial year 1000 without any such awful mundane catastrophic loosing of Satan, the manifestation of Antichrist as had been popularly expected tended to make men earnestly reason and question both on the long received millennial theory and on that of the Antichrist intended in prophecy more than before. Moreover, the arrival of the 12th century from Christ promised to open to expositors the first possible opportunity of some way applying the year-day principle, which had yet to be recognized, or which had yet to be, which had yet to be been recognized. Okay, I think that's a typo on page 35 there, or at least it's a not a very good sentence, which had yet not been recognized. Not to the smaller three and a half days prophetic period, but also to the great prophetic period of the 1260 days, without abandonment of the expectation ever intended of Christ's second advent being near. And uh, we have Dawn of the Reformation, Chapter 5. 1. The Identification of Babylon and Antichrist In the three centuries which preceded the Reformation, the papacy was seen by men in a new light and with growing clearness. The development of the man of sin reached its culmination, and the veil of professed sanctity which had concealed his real character fell from his shoulders. The papacy stood self-revealed. Victorious over the imperial power in the middle of the 13th century, the popes of Rome displayed far more ambition, arrogance, cruelty, and rapacity than the kingdoms of this world which they had struggled for the mastery. The self-constituted vicegerents of the Almighty, the popes now sat as God in the temple of God and compelled the nations of the earth to crouch in vassalage before them. They had enslaved alike the souls and bodies of their fellow creatures. Boniface VIII, who ascended the pontifical throne in 1294 surpassed even Innocent III in the arrogance of his pretensions, launching his spiritual thunderbolts against states and empires, summoning princes to his tribunal that he might, that he might as infallible judge settle their controversies, and laying claim to supreme dominion over the monarchs of the earth. During the period of 70 years which began in 1305, a fierce struggle for the papacy was carried on between rival factions, a set of popes and anti-popes. In Rome and Avignon fought for the tierra, pope hurled against pope the thunderbolts of anathemas and excommunications. The wealth of the papacy was enormous. The extortion and appropriation of benefices, the sale of bishoprics, of sacraments, of indulgences yielded a, yielded a golden tide of riches, swelling the pomp and augmenting the retinue of the pretended successors of the fishermen of Galilee. All efforts to reform the church proved abortive. The vices, flagrant sins, and public crimes of the popes of the last half of the 15th century and the early part of the 16th gave them a conspicuous place 
in the annals of infamy. Paul, too, was a great drunkard, put up all offices for sale, and spent all his days in weighing money in precious stones. He also directed an infamous war against the Hussites, oppressed his subjects, tortured the members of the literary institution because he affected to discover in it a dangerous conspiracy against the Pope. He died in the possession of a large treasure. Sixtus IV was not only guilty of conspiracy and of kindling the flames of war, but he was also dissolute, avaricious, intemperate, ferocious, and bloodthirsty. Innocent VIII established a bank at Rome for the sale of pardons. Each sin had its price with which might be paid at the convenience of the criminal. Alexander VI and his son Cesare were literally monsters in human shape. In early life, after he had become a cardinal, he was publicly censured for his gross debauchery. Afterwards, he, he had five acknowledged children by a Roman matron named, named Venosia. After the death of Innocent in 1492, he succeeded by the grossest bribery in securing for himself the Triple Crown. He had become rich through his preferment and through inheritance from his uncle Calixtus III. Of 25 cardinals, only five did not sell their votes. He is known to have sent four mules laden with silver to one and to have given another a sum of 5,000 golden crowns. After his elevation, he plunged without scruple and remorse into the practice of every vice and the preparation of every crime. His bastards were now brought forth and acknowledged as his children. The papal palace became the scene of bacchanalian orgies. Licentious songs swelled by a chorus of revelers echoed through the banqueting hall. Indecent plays were acted in the presence of the pontiff. He himself quaffed large draughts of wine from the foaming goblet. He indulged in licentiousness of the grossest description. Venality prevailed in the papal court. The highest dignities in the church were conferred without shame on the best bidders. He committed the greatest crimes for the advancement of his children. One of them, Cesare Borgia, was a fiend incarnate. The assassin's dagger and the poison bowl were the constant instruments of his vengeance. Almost every night some assassination which he had ordered took place in the streets of Rome. The inhabitants were in constant terror of their lives. He caused the murder of his brother, of whom he was jealous, because he was preferred by a mistress with whom they were both intimate. Because he was... Oh, these deeds were possible only in the spot where the highest temporal and spiritual authority were united in the same person. The palace of the popes was, in fact, a pandemonium. At length, the reign of Alexander came to a sudden termination. He perished by a poison draught, which Cesare had prepared for one of the cardinals whose wealth excited the cupidity of the Borgias. Multitudes which gazed on that livid corpse as it lay in state in seats in St. Peter's Church breathed a fervent thanksgiving to Almighty God for deliverance from the tyranny of an execrable, inexorable monster whose crimes had polluted the land, disgraced human nature, and placed him on a level with the very beasts that perish. The impurities, cruelties, and tyrannies of these and other popes of the period opened the eyes of the nations, while the con contemporaneous intervention of printing and revival of learning poured a blaze of light on these deeds of darkness. 
the world stood aghast with horror at the contemplation of deeds as bad as those perpetrated in the darkest period of pagan antiquity. A distinguished Roman Catholic historian whose testimony on this subject is not likely to be questioned acknowledges the corrupt state of the Church of Rome before the Reformation in emphatic terms. For some years, says Bellarmine, before the Lutheran and Calvinistic heresies were published, there was not, as contemporary authors testify, any severity in ecclesiastical judiciatories, any discipline with regard to morals, any knowledge of sacred literature, any reverence for divine things. There was not almost any religion remaining. Recognition of the fulfillment of the prophecies relating to the man of sin or Antichrist. History had interpreted prophecy and justified the predictions in the word of God. Men's eyes were open. This then was what the apostles and prophets had foretold. The thing predicted, the thing unexpected, the incredible thing had come to pass. Antichrist was come. The man of sin was there, clothed in scarlet and purple, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, crowned with priestly mitre, and the proud diadem of the tiara, the vice Christ, an enemy of the gospel, a persecutor of the saints, a monster of iniquity. He was there, lifted up at his coronation to sit on the high altar of St. Peter, worshipped by cardinals, adored by superstitious multitudes, a usurper of the place and prerogatives of God, a false idol, covetous, cruel, blood-stained, drunken with the blood of the saints and martyrs of Jesus. He was there in the seven-hilled city. He was there in the temple of God. Yes, this was he. Such were the convictions and confessions of God's faithful saints and servants of those days. In examining their testimony, one cannot but be impressed by the spirit which animated the medieval witnesses to the gospel truth, for such they were, their whole contention against the system of Rome being on the ground of its antagonism to the truth as it is in Jesus the faith once delivered to the saints, the seriousness of their spirit, their wholehearted earnestness, their depth of conviction, the simplicity and singleness of their aim, the influencing courage, the boldness of their attitude and tone, the recall, recall the confessors of apostolic days, the men who had been with Jesus. In the presence of this long line of witnesses, one seems to hear a voice as from heaven saying, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. As the eyes of the mind are open, we come to see that the spirit which animated, which animated and upheld these noble men and women was none other than the spirit of Jesus, that he himself was in them, and that was the profound secret of their utter unworldliness, their bold antagonism to error and superstition, their deep humility, their sanctity and strength. In these, his servants and followers, Jesus Christ walked on earth during those long dark centuries. Risen from the dead, he repeated in them the testimony he had borne to the truths of the everlasting gospel in the days of his earthly life and the three and a half years of his own testimony, clothed in sackcloth, had their parallel in the three and a half times of their clothed in sackcloth witnessing, the 1260 literal days of the one answering to the 1260 years of the other, while his death and resurrection on the third day were paralleled by their re death and resurrection and subsequent resurrection after that three-year interval during which their enemies pronounced their testimony extinct. Thus did the Lord of glory pass twice 
through analogous terrestrial experiences, first in his own person and next in the person of his saints and followers, the members of his body, his flesh and his bones, first in his briefer period, then in the longer, the one period answering to the other on the prophetic scale of a day for a year. Here is the one here is one of the principal keys to the times and visions of the Revelation. Here is the key to the story of the Church of the Middle Ages, and it is furnished by the word of prophecy as compared with the facts of history. When with our understanding thus open to the meaning of this long central period of the history of the Christian Church, intervening between the fall of paganism in the 4th century and the reformation of the 16th and 17th centuries, we examine the records relating to the Paulicians, the Albigenses, the Waldenses, the Wycliffites, the Lollards, and the Hussites, who in Eastern and Western Europe, in Armenia and Bulgaria, in the south of France, in the Alps of Piedmont, in Lombardy, in England and Bohemia, kept the lamp of the gospel, of gospel testimony burning all through the Middle Ages, unextinguished by the superstitions, apostasies, and persecutions of those dismal times, and handed it on to the firm grasp of the reformers to be lifted up and set on a candlestick in the midst of Europe and in the eyes of the nations to shine as a great luminary of modern days, we recognize the unbroken continuity of the testimony of the true and living Church of Christ and the fulfillment of his promise that against the church he founded 1800 years ago, upon a rock, the gates of hell should never prevail, that the living church should continue and its witness continue unconquered and unchanged from age to age, the very gospel sounded forth by his lips and by those of his apostles, still sounding, sounding still as an undying testimony from century to century in the utterances of his faithful saints, of his faithful saints until triumphant over all opposition, it should fill the world as the voice of many waters and mighty thunders, and as the music of harpers harping with their harps. Okay, you're listening to Cross the Border. This is our Prophecy Reality Edition, and we're going through uh, History Unveiling Prophecy, or Time as an Interpreter, a uh, republication of H. Grattan Guinea's uh, 110-year-old work, approximately. Um, and you can get that from us. Yeah, free e-copy. Go to our free e-copy uh, tab there at crossborder.org and ask for a copy. And, uh, and you can join us or read it at your own leisure. Okay, we're going to continue uh, reading where we left off when we get back from some messages. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> ahead of the dominant media, FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. 
The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment rights media channel. You've noticed that there are few commercials on this radio network, and there's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our various affiliates. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs on our Listen and Schedule pages. Then when you subscribe, we'll send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We ask you to give much less than a tie so that you may also send support directly to a particular program, host, or cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Across the border, this is our prophecy reality edition, and uh, well, we need your help here at Cross the Border. Um, we're uh, two men working very hard right now, and uh, not even making a decent salary for one man. So, um, please pray about. Uh, I know there are people out there I know that make a hundred thousand dollars a year, or whatever. You could tithe to uh, Cross the Border and help us out that way. Um, I know that not very many people. Are or if anyone's tithing to this ministry, but it would be a great help if uh, some people could uh, appreciate any gift, even a one-time gift, but one-time gifts only give one time, so we can't count on them. We can just do a little catch-up with them. Uh, we need to, until we can figure out a way to improve our income, and we're working on that too by publishing. And uh, it's a little bit, but it's, uh, it's not enough yet. Um, it, it may take years before um, we get any th- enough from publishing to to, uh, um, to make any money. Plus that, nobody is interviewing me. And what you could do for me is to help me out is find someone that will interview me on my book, When the Third Temple is Built. Um, get me on Alex Jones. Get me on whoever, wherever. And uh, if I can get the word out there, maybe uh, we could get a little more funding for our labors here uh, by actually getting funded for our labors. <laughs> but anyway, you can add your labor to ours. That's the whole idea of giving to the work of God is where you take your work as a carpenter or whatever you do and you take some of that labor and give it to God and you fund us with it and you add your labor to ours 
and store up treasure where neither moth nor rust can corrupt and neither can thieves break, break through and steal. Yes, that heavenly treasure in God's kingdom that will be there forever and uh, continue to walk in his kingdom so that you can obtain that treasure one day and have the benefit of it. Jesus' instruction were to store up your treasure. So make sure you're doing it and, uh, and help us out. Okay, let's uh, jump back into um, page 40 of History Unveiling Prophecy. Okay, and here's where we left off. And so we turn, though it be but for a brief and superficial examination, to the records of those days before the Reformation, and open the histories of the Albigenses, Waldenses, Lollards, Hussites, the story of Constantine, of Silvanus the Paulician, of Sergius, of Claude of Turin, of the Publicani in England, and the ancient Leonists, the French Valdenses, and Peter Waldo of Wycliffe and Huss, and Jerome of Prague. The memorable story is such, is the memorable the memorable story is told in such works as Sismondi's, Hen Sismondi's History of the Crusade Against the Albigenses. In Alex, on the Churches of the Albigenses, in Faber's valuable book on the history and theology of the ancient Waldenses and Albigenses, in Jean Legger's folio of the history of the Vaudois, in the authentic details of the Valdenses by Brees, in Gilly's Waldensian researches, in Dr. Alex, Alexis Mutton's Israel of the Alps, in the historical defense of the Waldenses by uh, Jean Rudolf Pegrin, in the valuable volume on the Churches of Piedmont by Moreland, Cromwell's commissioner, in the illustrated book of the Protestant Valleys of the Piedmont, Dauphiny, and the Bande de la Roche by Dr. Beatty, in Fox's Acts and Monuments of the Martyrs, in the writings of Wycliffe, in the voluminous works of John Huss, in the history of the Reformation and Anti-Reformation in Bohemia, in McCree's history of the progress and the suppression of the Reformation in Italy and in Spain, in Limbork's massive work on the history of the Inquisition, in Lorente's history of the Inquisition in Spain from its establishment to the reign of Ferdinand VII, an author who had been secretary of the Inquisition, and in Elias Hori Apocalyptica on the witnesses of the Middle Ages, works which cast a flood of light on the history of the long line of Christian confessors in pre-Reformation times and the noble army of martyrs of those never-to-be-forgotten days. And in the forefront of these testimonies, we boldly place Bousset's scornful work on the variations of the Protestant churches, in which he pours forth the vials of contempt and oblique O obloquy on the despicable heretics, the Waldenses, obviously a Catholic, Albigenses and their predecessors, the Paulicians of Armenia and Bulgaria and the poor men of Lyon, the Bohemian Brethren, the impious and pernicious English, English arch heretic Wycliffe, the Taborites, the Calixtines, and others of whom the world was not worthy. As we turn over the pages of the eloquent Bishop of Mo, the friend of Louis XIV and persecutor of Madame Guion and the Huguenots, we realize the truth of the apocalyptic description of the medieval witnesses to the gospel. 
which depicts them as clothed in sackcloth. For there in the pages of Bousset's work, these men of God stand dressed in sackcloth of opprobrium. Are, they are accursed, or they are accused of ignorance, of error, of manichaeism, of schism, of hypocrisy, of presumption, of vain pretensions. They are treated as the scum of the earth, the off-scouring of all things, the learned and noble legger, one of the Wada barbs or pastors, and their most celebrated historian, is stigmatized as unquestionably the most bold and ignorant of all mankind. Wycliffe, the blessed translator of the Bible into the English tongue, subverted all order in the church and state, and filled both tumult, and filled both with tumult and sedition. The poor men of Lyon were obstinate heretics. Though St. Bernard testified of the Thalusian heretics that their manners are irreproachable, they oppress none, they injure no man, their countenances are mortified and wan and wane with fasting, they eat not their bread like sluggards, but labor to gain a livelihood, yet their piety is but a despised, inspect the foundation, it was pride, it was hatred against the clergy, it was rancor against the church, this made them drink in the whole poison of the abominable heresy. These heretics never ceased in veying against human inventions and citing the holy scriptures, whence they always had a text on hand on all occasions. This was their crime, and it was the crime which later on produced the Reformation and gave birth to the temporal and spiritual liberties of the modern world. We pursue Bousset, we pursue Bousset no further. Faber has answered him in his learned work on the true history and doctrines of the ancient Valdenses and Albigenses, and in the variation of popery. Edgar has turned the tables on the Bishop of Mo and has shown that it is the Church of Rome that has swerved from the teachings of the Apostles and not the Waldenses, Wycliffites, Hussites, and Reformers, and that in all their leading and characteristic doctrines, Rome has declined and departed from the faith of apostolic times. And now we reach the question as to how long this line of medieval witnesses to gospel truth interpreted the predictions in the Revelation. And kindred prophecies with reference to the Antichrist or man of sin. Did they recognize the fulfillment of these prophecies in the papacy? Rome stood before them, revealed in her thousand superstitions, her proud pretensions, her persecuting actions. The head of that, apost the head of that apostate church stood forth before their eyes, crowned with the glittering tiara of a, tri of a triple sovereignty in heaven, earth, and hell, claiming to be the vicar of Christ and vicegerent of God on earth. Did they recognize his portrait in the word of God? Did they write his name beneath that portrait and leave their testimony for the enlightenment of later years? They did. And having written it, they sealed the testimony with their blood. 250 years before Wycliffe stood forth as a, the champion of Protestant truth, 300 years before Huss and Jerome confronted the Council of Constance, 400 years before Luther published his 95 Thesis in Wittenberg, the Waldenses wrote their treatise on Antichrist, a copy of which is contained in Legger's folio volume dated A.D. 1120 that treatise whose doctrine is the same as their catechism dated 1100. That was the doctrine they faithfully maintain century after century, thus begins. In it is taught that the papal or Romish system was that of Antichrist, which from infancy in apostolic times had grown gradually, 
by the increase of its constituent parts to the stature of a full-grown man that its prominent characteristics were to defraud God of the worship due him, rendering to, to creatures, whether departed saints, relics, images, or antichrist, i.e. the antichristian body itself, to defraud Christ by attributing justification and forgiveness to antichrist's authority in words, to the intercession of saints, to the merit of men's own performances, and to the fire of purgatory, to defraud the Holy Spirit by attributing regeneration and sanctification to the opus operatum of the two sacraments, that the origin of this anti-Christian religion was the, covetous, was the covetousness of the priesthood, its tendency to lead men away from Christ, its essence a vain ceremonial, its foundation the false notions of grace and truth. Antichrist, says this treatise, is covered with the appearance of truth and righteousness, is outwardly adorned with Christ's name, offices, scriptures, and sacraments. But though covered and adorned with the semblance of Christ, his church and faithful members opposes him to the salvation wrought by Christ. He perverts unto himself the worship properly due to God alone. He robs and deprives Christ of his merits with the whole sufficiency of grace, righteousness, regeneration, remission of sins, sanctification, confirmation, and spiritual nourishment, and imputes and attributes them to his own authority, to his own doings, or to the saints and their intercession, or to the fire of purgatory. He thus separates the people from Christ and leads them away to the things already mentioned. He attributes the regeneration by the Holy Spirit to a dead outward faith on which the same faith he ministers orders and the other sacraments. He rests the whole religion and sanctity of the people upon the mass. He does everything to be seen and to glut his insatiable avarice. He allows manifest sins without ecclesiastical censure and excommunication. He defends his unity not by the Holy Spirit, but by secular power. He hates, persecutes, and makes inquisition after, and robs and puts to death the members of Christ. These are the principal works of Antichrist, and this system of iniquity taken together is called Antichrist, or Babylon, or the fourth beast, or the harlot, or the man of sin, the son of perdition. <clears throat> Such also was the belief of the Albigenses. All, agree, all agreed, says Sismonde, in regarding the Church of Rome as having absolutely perverted Christianity and in maintaining that it was she who was designated in the Revelation by the name of the Whore of Babylon. Even in the Romish Church, the same view began to make its appearance towards the close of the 12th century. The celebrated Joachim Abbas in his commentary on the Revelation, written in 1183, declared that the harlot city reigning over the kings of the earth undoubtedly meant Rome, and that the false prophet foretold in the Revelation would probably issue out of the bosom of the church, and that Antichrist might even then be in the world through the hour of this, his revelation. Though the hour of his revelation had not yet come, Joachim stood, no, Joachim was an abbot of the Roman Catholic Church in Calabria, learned in the Holy Scriptures, a deep student of the prophetic word. A few years after, a few years later, Almeric and his disciples taught that Rome was Babylon, and the Roman Pope Antichrist, uh, Jean Pierre de Olive, another professed follower of Joachim and leader in Languedoc, 
of the austere and more spiritual second section of the recently formed Franciscan body in a work entitled Pastilles on the, Reforma on the Revelation Pastilles on the Revelation affirmed that the Church of Rome was the whore of Babylon, the mother of harlots, the same that St. John beheld sitting upon the scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, and the chief and proper Antichrist, a pseudo-pope. Also very remarkably, that some reformation with fuller effusion of the gospel light might be expected prior to Rome's final predicted destruction in order that, through its rejection of that light, God's destruction of it might be the rather justified before the world. In the following century, Robert Grosshead, Bishop of Lincoln, boldly proclaimed the Pope to be Antichrist. Christ came into the world to save and win souls, he said, Therefore he that feareth not to destroy souls, may he not worthily be called Antichrist. He foretold on his deathbed, with tokens of deepest emotion, that the church should not be delivered from the, her Egyptian servitude, but by violence, force, and the bloody sword. In the same century, the immortal Dante denounced the Church of Rome as the Babylon of the Revelation, painting the papacy in his poem on hell, Purgatory and Paradise, in vivid colors as the world beheld it then. Woe to thee, Simon Magus! Woe to you, his wretched followers, who the things of God, which would be which should be wedded into goodness, them rapacious as ye are, do prostitute for gold and silver. Your avarice overcasts the world with mourning underfoot, treading the good and raising bad men up. Of shepherds like to you, the evangelist was where, when her, to who sits upon the ways, with kings in filthy whoredom he beheld, she who with seven heads towered at her birth, and from ten horns her proof of glory drew, long as her spouse and virtue took delight of gold and silver you have made your God, differing wherein from the idolater, but with he worships one, a hundred ye. Ah, Constantine, to how much ill gave birth, not thy conversion, but that plunteous dower which the first wealthy father gained from thee. In his poem on paradise, he says, My place he who, my place he who usurps on earth hath made a common sewer of puddle and blood. No purpose was of ours that keys which were vouchsafed me should for ensign serve unto the banners which do levy war on the baptized, nor I for vigil mark, set upon solid and lying privileges, which makes me off to bicker and turn red, in shepherd's clothing, greedy wolves below, range o wide o'er the plastures, arm of God, why longer sleepest thou? At the end of his poem on paradise, he refers to the Apostle John as the seer that ere he died saw all the grievous times of that of the fair bride who with the lance and nails has won. Dante died in 1321. Petrarch, who was crowned with the laurel poetry by the Roman Senate in 1341, drew in eloquent words the same picture of the papacy. Three years after Dante's death, or about the year 1324, Wycliffe was born, the morning star of the Reformation. Grand and solitary witness, he stood forth, Bible in hand, a hundred and fifty years before the days of Luther, a light shining in the darkness of the Middle Ages, like some mountaintop, 
while all the rest of the world lies in darkness, illuminated with the glory of the unrisen sun, he wrote a library of learned and powerful disquisitions. But his great work was the translation of the Bible into the English language. The scripture only is true was his maxim, and he translated as well as circulated the priceless word of God. Okay, that's where we're going to cut off today. You're listening to Cross the Border, our Prophecy Reality Edition, and we're going through History Unveiling Prophecy, an original work uh, republished by us and updated, of course, uh, I think in a much, much better uh, um, publication than what we found. And we're going to pick up here next week when we get back. So make sure you come back next week. Uh, we do a live broadcast every Wednesday morning called Prophecy Reality. First hour we have uh, news and uh, your calls and questions and uh, quite a lively debate this morning. So we hope that continues and grows. And hopefully you'll come back and join us uh, as you're able to on Wednesday morning. Make sure you go to my website, crosstheborder.org, and subscribe there, and you'll get a reminder email every Wednesday morning to join us. So, uh, And also, every time we publish an article or one of our broadcasts, uh, you'll get a notification of that also. And while you're there, click on the free ebook tab and get any of these books that you see on my website absolutely free. All you have to do is follow the instructions and then request whichever copy you want. Okay, until the next time we meet, uh, may the Almighty bless each and every one of you as you continue walking in His kingdom. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, -S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthebordered.org.